be included with um, in a story about Christ on a mountain, right? Okay. The, now Satan, the arch fiend, we're told at line 357, now becomes undisguised. Unlike Eve, who can't see through Satan's disguise, the, the son can. And Satan will now speak. Tis true. I am that spirit unfortunate who, leagued with millions more in rash revolt, kept not my happy station, but was driven with them from bliss to the bottomless deep. Milton, of course, is playing games with a close reader of his poems. Bliss is the last word that Satan will speak, of course, in Paradise Lost before he's turned into a serpent in hell with the other demons. And we'll follow Bliss to line 419 here in a little bit, um, Lost Bliss. Milton, the genius, is playing all kinds of games with the word bliss. Yet, to that hideous place not so confined by rigor and conniving, but that oft leaving my dolorous prison, I enjoy large liberty to round this globe of earth or, rare, or, or range in the air. Nor from the heaven of heavens hath he excluded my resort sometimes. I came among the sons of God when he gave up into my hands Uzi and Job, Job of, of the land of Uz, um, to prove him, Job in the same way tested, and illustrate his high worth. Um, the idea here is that uh, Satan is saying, uh, it is true that I roam, we'll get to the last word of book one in a bit, that I roam around, but it's because I'm allowed to, and I do a very important thing. I help test to bring about proof of who actually is a true believer. It's interesting that by line 376, um, we're going to get a fascinating bit of statement, though. That's uh, uh, um, what Satan will say about himself. Though I have, and I want you to pay attention to the way in which the word lost is going to appear at the end of all three of the next lines, but there will be several more losts involved. Though I have lost much luster of my native brightness, lost to be beloved of God, I have not lost to love, at least contemplate and admire what I see excellent and good or fair or virtuous, I should so have lost all sense. What can be then less in me than desire to see thee and approach thee whom I no, declared the Son of God, to hear, attend thy wisdom, and behold thy godlike deeds. Men generally think me much a foe to all mankind. Why should I? They to me never did wrong or violence. By them I lost not what I lost. Rather, by them I gained what I have gained, and with them dwell co-partner in these regions of the world, if not disposer. Lend them oft my aid, oft my advice, by presages and signs and answers, oracles, portents, and dreams, whereby they may direct their future life. In other words, he says, I play a really important role, even though so much for me has been lost. Of course, he continues, at first, uh, companions of my misery and woe, at first it may be, but long since with woe, we know that word from Paradise Lost, Never acquainted, now I feel by proof, that is to say trial, that fellowship in pain divides not smart, nor lightens off each man's peculiar load. Small consolation then, where man adjoined, this wounds me most, what can it less? That man, man fallen, shall be restored, I nevermore. Line 405. In other words, Satan says it. I'm aware that I'm fallen and I'm lost and there's no way I'm ever getting up. There's no salvation for me. Man, maybe, possibly, but not for me. The, um, the, the response by Christ is wonderful, uh, you might say, um, Christ's insulting of Satan. Deservedly thou grievest, composed of lies from the beginning and in lies wilt end who boastest the release from hell and leave to come into the heaven of heavens. Thou comest indeed as a poor miserable captive thrall comes to the place where he before had sat among the prime and splendor, now disposed, ejected, empty, gazed, unpitied, shunned, a spectacle of ruin or of scorn to all the host of heaven. In other words, the only reason you get to come back into heaven is so everybody can make fun of you and laugh at you. You're no hero. I can't believe you even think that. The happy place imparts to thee no happiness, no joy. Rather, inflames thy torment. Notice the word inflames, right? Representing lost Bliss, we're back again to line 361 in the word bliss, to thee 
no more communicable. So never more in hell than when in heaven, line 420, 421. But thou art serviceable to heaven's king. In other words, he says it, you are a tool. Right, you are a tool. There is, um, I, you know, God can use you um, for His own uh, for His own needs. And then at line four twenty nine, it's a fun line as well. For lying is thy sustenance, thy food. Yet thou pretendest to truth. Um, and then he speaks at uh, at uh, about the answers that are at line four thirty four. He says. Um, uh, but what have been thy answers? What but dark, ambiguous, and with double sense deluding, which they who asked have seldom understood, and not well understood, as good not known. Um, we think here of um, uh, the, remember those lines that we studied together um, in Macbeth 1.3? When the witches will hail Mac, uh, Macbeth, and do you remember Banquio will give that uh, that suggestion of caution? Oft times he says to win us, right? The the powers of darkness will say things that seem fair that in fact are not. Uh, in other words, here, notice what Christ is saying. You are a bad interpreter. I told you we'd be playing around with this notion of hermeneutics and the way we interpret text. He says it. You're a bad interpreter. You are not a good interpreter. And your answers are jacked. At line uh, 442, we've got uh, Milton's Theodicy. For God hath justly given the nations up to thy delusions, justly since they fell idolatrous. But when his purpose is among them to declare his providence, to thee not known, whence hast thou then thy truth? but from him or his angels precedent in every province, who themselves disdaining to approach thy temples, give thee in command what to the smallest tittle thou shalt say to thy adorers. Thou with trembling fear like a fawning parasite, wow, what a great insult, fawning parasite, obeyest, then to thyself ascribe the truth foretold. But this thy glory shall be soon retrenched. And the idea of glory is going to come back in a later in a later book for us, obviously, one of the temptations. No more shalt thou by oracling abuse the Gentiles. Henceforth, oracles are ceased. We think of the Delphi Oracle and Milton making that, that reference, obviously, there. And thou no more with pomp and sacrifice shalt be inquired at Delphos or elsewhere. Of course, the Delphos or the Delphi Oracle is huge. In remember our study of uh, Plato's Apology in an earlier lecture, we even talked about that, right? Into the world, he says, God hath now sent his living oracle into the world to teach his final will. John 16, 33 comes to mind here. Send, and sends his spirit of truth henceforth to dwell in pious hearts, an inward oracle, we think of a paradise within, to all truth requisite for men to know. So we're back to the idea of knowledge in 464. And it will be here now that um, um, Christ will say it, um, that it's over. In other words, uh, uh, God has taken care of you and will finally put you to your end. So spake our Savior. But the subtle fiend, thus inly stung with anger and disdain, disassembled, and his answer, smooth, returned. Now this is interesting because it's like Satan knows that he's, he's lost this, this first exchange, and yet he's going to come back sharply, he says. Thou hast insisted on rebuke and urged me hard with doings which not will, but misery hath wrested from me. Where easily canst thou find one miserable and not enforced oft times to part from truth, if it may stand him more instead to lie, say and unsay, feign, flatter, or abjure? In other words, lying is of great value. We think of Machiavelli's prince, don't we? A great dissembler is a great politician. We need those kinds of people. But thou art placed above me, thou art Lord, from thee I can and must submiss, endure, check, or reproof, and glad to escape so quit. Hard are the ways of truth and rough to walk. This is Satan speaking. It's a beautiful line, though. Hard are the ways of truth and uh, rough to walk. Matthew 7, 13 comes to mind, right? Smooth on the tongue discoursed, 
pleasing to the ear and tunable as sylvan piper song. What wonder then if I delight to hear her dictates from thy mouth? Most men admire virtue who follow not her lore. Permit me to hear thee when I come, since no man comes and talk at least though I despair to attain. In other words, let me come back and have more conversation with you. Thy father, who is holy, wise, and pure, suffers the hypocrite or atheist priest to tread his sacred courts and minister above his altar, handling holy things, praying or vowing, and vouchsafed his voice to, ba to Balaam, reprobate, a prophet, yet inspired, disdain not such access to me. Line 492. Um, Milton, of course, slamming the unbelieving priest, the atheist priest, Especially, he would, of course, be thinking as a Protestant of his acrimony towards Catholic priests, right? Finally, at 493, to finish this book, to whom our Savior with unaltered brow, this comes back to that notion of paradise lost where God's face doesn't change, unemotional, he says, Thy coming hither, though I know thy scope, I bid not or forbid. In other words, you do what you want to do, okay? Though, he says... Or, 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 or forbid. Do as thou findest permission from above, thou canst not more. In other words, the only thing you can do is what God allows you to. Go back to Paradise Lost Book 4, lines 1006 to 1109, and the idea that Gabriel at the end of Book 4 will say is, um, we, we're, we're, we're only doing what God is allowing us to do. He added not. Now, it's an important line, I think, at line 497. He added not. In other words, the Son, when he speaks... He does not go on and on. He's very laconic. He's very precise, right? He added not. In other words, I've said all I need to say. And Satan, bowing low, his gray dissimulation, disappeared into thin air, diffused. This, of course, will immediately make us think of that, uh, that line from Tempest, um, Act 4, uh, line, um, Act, um, Act 4, lines 1 through 150, and then again in, in 4-2. Um, if, uh, the quote is, these, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air, end quote. I am convinced that, sh that Milton had Tempest in mind as he was finishing this. For now began night, we think of the dark night of the soul, with her sullen wing, we think here of Virgil's night wings of Aeneid 8369, to double shade the desert, fowls in their clay nests were crouched, and now wild beasts came forth the woods to roam. In other words, it is the end of the first trial, and the animals all come out at night, and Satan will leave, and Christ is alone, the Son of God. And that's the end. Book one ends with Satan defeated and Christ heroic. We can think as well of Adam and Eve leaving, of course, paradise at the end of the, uh, in, leaving Eden at the end of paradise lost on their way. All right, let's finish now quickly with level 2A, themes and messages. Uh, of course, uh, first thing we want to point out, this is, a, this is a poem about hunger and about feeding. It's, of course, a poem about interpretation and the way that eating a text, remember what Bacon says in uh, of studies, some books are to be t tasted, some few to be chewed and swallowed and fully digested. Uh, of course, this uh, major theme of obedience, who to obey, self or God, we're back to the Paradise Lost themes as well. And of course, one other major theme is the wilderness test, as we might think about it, right? Um, um, sometimes that, that wilderness is an actual desert. Sometimes here. Sometimes, of course, it's a dark wood like in Dante. Sometimes it's the wide, wide sea of uh, Coleridge's uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, right? Uh, 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 he says, I've been on a, on a sea, a wide, wide sea. So, so it's, it's felt like... God, God scarce there seem to be, the old man will tell the young man in that, in that text. Let's think a little bit about 2B and the rhetorical power of what Milton, game Milton is playing here. Major symbols, of course, the stones to bread is a major one. We think about the feeding of the 5,000, which is a story in all four Gospels, as we referenced earlier in the idea that Christ is the bread of heaven, the bread of life. I've already mentioned the Platonic dialogues, of course, Christ as the Socrates who is battling against, uh, you know, his interlocutors. Only Christ is the better oracle, right? All, all, all other oracles are now, are now over. I've already mentioned, of course, 
Tempest is clearly on Milton's mind. Another Tempest, think about that. It's another text about how to read texts and how to interpret. At 3a, relationship to other texts. We've already mentioned Plato's dialogues. Think about this. What is the Crito about if it's not about the temptation to leave and not go through the long, hard, dark night of the soul that culminates with Socrates' death? You see my comments there in Harvard Classics lecture number six. Or how about this one? What about Plato's apology where, Socrates will say it, the unexamined life is not worth living. The notion of examining your life, that's fundamentally what the Christ, uh, the Son of God character is doing in his soliloquy. You can again and take, uh, go back to the Harvard Classics lecture number five and take a look at my comments on that one. Of course, we've already mentioned the Tempest, right? And we'll just say that Shakespeare is easily um, going to be compared here. The Tempest, right? We begin with Prosper and Prospero comes to mind, right? And we end with this um, diffused into thin air line. Of course, Brave New World is the most famous line from uh, the Tempest. And I think that uh, there, there probably was some consideration of that line and the notion of Eden and paradise regained the paradise within. Let's keep watching like we are watching a Shakespeare play to see how things unfold with that one. Hey, but how about this one? Think about Shakespeare's Othello. What is Iago if he's nothing more than a devil whispering into the ear of both Othello and Roderigo, right? The great deceiver, the great tempter, if you will. Think about Macbeth. What is it that Duncan says in 1-4? There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. It's hard to tell when somebody's lying when they're real. Of course... We can also think about other devils in disguise, good as Faust and Mephistopheles comes to mind. Remember, he's dressed up, or he's, he's in the shape of a dog, right? Um, what's your favorite movie for, uh, for the devil and how the devil is, is portrayed? What's your, what's your favorite one of that? Okay, let's finish up now at 3B with relationships to self. How about this one? And again, if these texts do anything and mean anything for us, as we've said in so many of our prior lectures, um, these texts have to mean something to us personally for them to mean anything, really. So how about this one? There's an interesting debate about man does not live by bread alone. Makes us think about Thoreau and his comment, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. Remember that he says to front only the essential facts of life? Remember that's what he said, the essential facts of life. And of course we ask then, what we'll ask now, what is it if you don't just live on the stuff you eat? If you got to have something else for your life to be happy, successful, what is that for you, right? What do you live by? Is it a code? What kind of code? What are your essentials of your life? How about this one? What was a time that you saw through somebody's lie? In other words, you were able to tell. You knew they were lying to you. What's a time when you didn't and it led maybe to your problems or whatever? What's a time you told a really good, bad lie? And how did you feel about it afterwards, especially if it created some negative energy? Well, let's turn now to book two, the next temptation. Let's ask if these temptations, right, because we've now done one, start to become symbols of something greater. For example, in the first temptation, it is the temptation to feed the body, the physical body. Why do you turn stones into bread? Okay? Let's take a look at the next temptation and then the one to follow. And let's see if there's any kind of uh, way we can begin to see these temptations as symbolic. Thank you. I'll be back here in a little bit and we'll work with uh, book two. Thank you.